Hi, I'm Riley. And I'm Ryder. And, and this, this is, is my dad's, dad's show. show. Hey, everybody. It's Casey Jaycox with The Quarterback DadCast. I want to say thanks to all of our listeners. Thanks to all of our sponsors for all your support. Uh, we are continuing to enjoy this journey together, inspiring dads. But I want to take a minute now to talk about Acme Homes. You've heard me talk about him before, but I'm going to talk about him again. Bob Cumming, former college teammate, amazing leader, amazing uh, home builder. They continue to take so much pride in the work they do, the craftsmanship, the attention to detail. Whether you're looking for a home up in Monroe, uh, up in Sultan, up in Wenatchee, this is where they're doing their amazing things. So many people during the pandemic, as we have the ability to work from home, have decided to move out of the city to try to find homes where there's more acreage. Well, that's exactly what Bob and team at Acme Homes give you. So check out Valley Vista up in Monroe. Check out Daisy Meadows out in Sultan. And if you want to even go to Eastern Washington, check out Sienna Heights in Wenatchee. They're, again, amazing craftsmanship, amazing floor plans. You can visit them at acmehomeswa.com. And if you're interested in learning specifically about uh, listings or uh, mortgage opportunities, contact Jen at 425-308. 8082 or Denise at 425-309-2318. So now, why are we doing a new ad? Because we want to talk about a partnership they have with Portage Bank. Kevin Jensen is one of the great lenders over there. He's a senior vice president. He's going to take care of you. And right now, if you obtain a mortgage through Portage Bank, uh, Bob and team and Acme Homes are going to pay f your $500 appraisal fee. I said that right. They're going to pay your $500 appraisal fee by buying a home through them, Getting your mortgage through the folks at Portage Bank. So don't don't wait. Now's the time to, to contact Jen. Contact Denise again. Jen's number is 425-308-8082. And again, Denise is at 425-309-2318. So visit acmehomeswa.com right now to go visit and learn about your next new home. Hey everybody, it's Casey Jacox again with the Quarterback Dadcast. We are in season three, and as a reminder, we are dedicating every episode to my pops, Big Mike Jacox. Uh, rest in peace, Dad. Um, it's been fun reliving uh, just memories of him on, on fellow guests. But today, uh, power of the internet, power of connections, um, we are talking to a gentleman named Ryan Johnson. He's the vice president of Fellowship Christian Athletes. He's down uh, based in Portland, Oregon. The guy's a former Pepperdine Wave. Spent some time in real estate, but he's been with FCA for over 10 plus years. So we're going to learn all about that. We're going to learn all about the impacts that they're having to communities, um, to kids, to whoever it may be. Um, but more importantly, we're going to understand um, about Ryan's background. We're going to learn about how Ryan is working hard to become that ultimate quarterback of his household. So without further ado, Mr. Johnson, welcome to the Quarterback Dadcast. Thanks, Casey. I'm glad to be here. Uh, exciting and uh, get to talk about being a dad. There's nothing better, right? It's the best, man. I spent uh, I spent about f I call it four and a half hours yesterday on the golf course, no phones, walking with my son, and uh, it's the third round in a row I've lost, uh, <laughs> which is not a not a record and a theme I'm I'm liking, but yeah. I do, but I love it because it means my son's getting better, and uh, he he got he shot seventy six, I shot seventy seven, so that's awesome. It was fun. Good lord, that's that's better than awesome. Is he planning on playing golf in college, or what's the deal there? It's a goal. He's only a sophomore, um, but he, he's had a good sophomore season. Yeah, they got they got districts here in a couple of weeks. Um, we're recording now, everybody, in May. When this episode comes out, we're going to be probably a few months from now. So hopefully when it comes out, we'll have news to share that things went really well in the state tournament for him and his That's teammates. Great. So, all right. So we start every episode uh, with gratitude. So I want to know, what are you most grateful for as a father right now? You know, I, I think coming in um, just based off last night, my wife was uh, working a night shift at the hospital and I'm uh, Mr. Dad with three kids and my oldest comes in and just gives my son the biggest hug and just says, I love you, buddy. Good night. And I just think seeing that relationship, man, I'm super grateful for that. Um, you know, we're, we're eight, five and two. So each one's at a kind of a unique season and um, just seeing them love on each other and encourage each other. I'm super thankful. That's cool. I brought a smile on my face. Just that those, the vi I, vi I could see it. Uh, and it's like those little, little things, those little, not things, those little moments of grat of love that we as dads and families need to slow down to be intentional and present to enjoy because 
world's not slowing down. There's enough negativity out there that I think if we are intentional about the things that keep us positive, it's, it is, uh, it is, uh, it's positive. So, um, for me, I'm grateful for today. And then, you know, I talked about a little bit before we, we start recording, my wife's having a little bit of a tough health day and I'm grateful for my schedule, which usually is fairly, very, very busy. I have a couple of hours like that I'm going to have open today that I'm going to just go around the house and just do anything I can to make the house better. And so that she's not even thinking about anything, she can just worry about her health. And, um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, That's awesome. so, um, okay. So we got, I want to hear about the, the who's in the Johnson huddle. We got three kids. Tell yeah. me a little bit about each one and tell me a little bit about your wife. Yeah. Um, Molly and I have been married for about 13 years. Um, kind of a fun story. Her dad, my dad were best friends and fraternity brothers in college. Um, ended up colliding with her at, uh, my parents 20th wedding anniversary party. Um, I think, uh, big man upstairs was, was involved in the, in the collision. I was kind of valet parking cars for people coming to the party. And we had invited her parents as, as old college friends. And, and she decided to, to kind of roll in and, and, and hang out. And so I think that was the last car I parked that night and, uh, just ran into that house and, and, uh, chased her down and got to know her a little bit. And, um, it, it was, it was kind of fun. The next morning I woke up and, and, so she had just graduated high school. I just graduated college and I'm in the proverbial living back at home for the first three months after graduating college going, what am I going to do with my life? And, uh, I, I go downstairs and I was like, Hey mom, uh, you know, what? Molly Schaefer, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna ask her out on a date. And, uh, my mom instantly looks at me. She's like, that's a horrible idea. She's way too good for you. And you'll ruin the family relationship. And I was like, you're a disgrace. I said, thanks for that encouragement, mom. But, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. So anyway, fun story ended up taking her on a, on a date and, um, yeah, we, we got an amazing, uh, family, a good huddle going three little kids got Abby is eight Tyler's five and Jordan is two and a half. Uh, so girl, boy, girl, and, uh, we're just having a ton of fun. You know, it's like I said, all three are kind of in unique phases. We're just about out of diapers for the first time in a decade. So that feels good. And uh, big milestone. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're doing well and, and enjoying every moment. How did the dads feel about this love connection? You know, the dads were dads were they were fired up about it. I think um, I knew like right off the bat that I was like, I think this is the girl I could spend the rest of my life with. So the relationship went kind of uh, zero to 60 pretty quick from a standpoint of, of long-term future. And so I I remember her dad kind of calling me in like six to eight weeks in and just saying, Hey, here's the deal. Like we're excited about you and Molly. We, we, we love you, but I want my daughter to have a college experience and you're four years ahead of her. And, uh, so you need to, you need to pump the brakes, you know, a little bit. And so that was, that was a, probably a, a godsend in the whole thing of, of me. And I had a lot of maturity work to do and grow up. So she ended up starting at UVO and then finishing at George Fox, uh, played soccer and it was, uh, got a nursing degree. And then we, we got married, uh, right after she graduated. That's awesome. I love stories. I always say, uh, there's a great thing as, as a work I'm doing, like as a speaker and coach, I heard this great thing. It says stories sell slides don't. Hmm. And you know, stories are what people connect to and they can find commonality and then build rapport off it, which builds leads to trust usually. And so I love this. My wife and I, we actually dated since seventh grade. Wow. Tw- I'm not I'm going much you dating in 12 as your 12 year old, but like we've known her <laughs> since seventh grade and uh, used to have a little, you know, band, a ski, ski bus, uh, romance. So all that stuff was, was pretty it. funny. Um, yeah. um, okay. Uh, what are your kids into out of curiosity? What they athletes? Oh man. Yeah. We got, uh, we're, we're, uh, softball Monday, Wednesday nights, uh, T-ball on Thursday nights, you know, the little ones just, just running around, uh, trying to keep up with their big sister and big brother. But I think, uh, you know, both, Molly and I were have an athletic background. And so, um, 
they're they're definitely following suit so far in that. But I'm I'm good with whatever they do. Uh, Abby specifically, though, sister is uh, intense when it comes to reading. I mean, she's reading two or three books a week right now, which is so not like her dad. So just praise God for her mom and uh, very academic and um, really is just just flourishing school wise. And uh, so but Ty's playing some T-ball and uh, loves being outside and building things. And we're, we're lucky to live on a little bit of land. And so he he's digging holes and chasing bugs and, and doing things that five year olds do. <laughs> so cool um okay then actually before i go back to to learn about a little about you give you a little uncle rico moment here shout out i always like to mention uncle rico and shout out to pulling dynamite as a mm-hmm. former collegiate quarterback but what, what were your sports i played uh pretty much all the sports growing up and then really kind of focused in on baseball once i got into into high school and and so um but yeah just just love competing and and uh but probably was most passionate about playing baseball. There we go. All right, man. Well, I want to uh, learn um, what was life like growing up for you? Where'd you grow up specifically? And, and maybe talk about how your parents shaped you that to into the dad that you are now. Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Westland, Oregon, uh, you know, pretty much lived here my whole, my whole life. And uh, I had two little sisters. I was the oldest of three and, um, you know, I, th- I think I grew up kind of like a uh, you know, normal American family, you know, my, my dad uh, was uh, in an executive leadership role most of my life, uh, kind of in the tech industry. And uh, my mom was a, a nurse, which I'm super thankful. Um, that's why I think God knew that I needed a wife that was a nurse too. And my mom was just a super nurturing, supportive, encouraging. I mean, she just cared for me from the, from the second I came out. And so um, just, just love her heart um, and just how she kind of just built that into me, what it means to serve and love and take care of others. And um, my dad is probably one of the best leaders I've ever been around and uh, just very dynamic. He's got a gift of communication. Um, he reads people well. And and um, and so I feel like he taught me a lot about what leadership looks like. And he called that leadership out in me, uh, in, in my journey. Um, I think we were... Uh, kind of just going through life. And it was probably about middle school. My dad had the opportunity to become the president of a company that was headquartered in Oslo, Norway. And and that really changed up our dynamic. Um, He was kind of taking a red eye from Portland to Washington, DC on Sunday nights and living in a condo over there and um, coming back on Friday. And I think from that point, kind of my middle school and high school, there was, it was, just a different dynamic for our family. You know, my mom was at some level, a single mom, uh, mm-hmm. with, with three little kids. And, and for me, um, those were like formative identity years of who am I and what am I about and purpose and significance. And so I think that was, there was definitely some strain, um, as far as like me just having a, I think every man, to be honest, kind of has this idea written in on our hearts that we want to make our dad proud. Like, I think I personally feel like coming from a faith background that, that God's kind of Im- implanted that on our hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we have this DNA to, to want to put a smile on our dad's face. And I certainly did. And that was a big deal for me. I wanted to make him proud. And, and I think just being immature, the outlet for that for me was athletics, you know, and, and trying to live up to his expectations or what I thought his expectations were and all those things. And so I think those were tough years for me as I struggled. And, uh, just to be honest, I, I didn't know who I was Yeah, and I had, I had some real identity issues. And I think that was connected to some daddy issues of, uh, it's just not a very firm foundation to build a life on trying to, trying to please somebody else, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, so I'd say high school was, was a challenge for me. Um, I was kind of into all the things normal high school kids get into, uh, when they're, when they're searching for identity. And, uh, but luckily kind of the only thing that, that I didn't blow up were my grades. Cause I was just so stinking competitive. And I think God was kind of in that for me, as far as kind of determining my path and gave me an opportunity to get out of Westland and go down to, to Pepperdine and continue my education. And, um, 
I'm sure thankful that that worked out, but I had a loving family. I mean, my parents loved me. My dad and mom loved me. I just think for there was a season that my dad really got caught up in, in climbing that ladder and, mm-hmm. and there were sacrifices that came with that, you know, but, um, we have an amazing relationship today and there's, that's a whole nother story of kind of how that got redeemed. But, um, I love my parents. That's awesome. How, um, how, how long did your dad take that role? So I think that was the better part of, uh, like I said, sixth, seventh grade to, so probably four or five, six years that he was in that role. And and it actually continued on into my sophomore year in college. And, uh, that was, there was a turning point actually kind of a combination of, of me entering into my faith journey and my mom getting breast cancer Mm. and kind of awakened him to, to a new reality of life. And, uh, so he, he, he finished up and that his, the company ended up getting bought out, which was perfect for him and, and kind of took a new path in his life. Mm. And as you think about like lessons learned, like through maybe that experience and thank you for the sharing the story, cause I know that will speak to a lot of people listening. Um, tell me, tell me one or two things you, you learned out, out of that, that like maybe the difficult sides is the son, but now as the dad, you are now like, tell me what, what comes to mind. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I would start with just identity, um, man, sports are there, you know, you probably, I've heard the quote, like, you know, baseball is a great game, but it's an awful God and you can fill in the sport. Right. In other words, man, I, I had some awesome experiences and learned a ton of life lessons from, you know, primarily playing football, basketball, baseball growing up, you know, and, and I'm, I love that. And I learned a lot, but, but it, it is a horrible identity and it, and it didn't bring security. And I mean, you're, when your identity is wrapped up in something that is a, in my opinion, not eternal. Um, and, and it can be taken away at any second. It's just a slippery slope. Right. And we've all, I mean, I, I've heard your story about the injury that, that you faced and how that kind of changed your path, but you know, at the, in the end, probably for the better and life experiences, all those things. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I think the lessons that I learned through that season of my life was, was who am I? Mm-hmm. And, and what does unconditional love really look like? And, and was I created, you know, on purpose for a purpose? And, uh, I feel like the answer to that was yes. I love that, man. Yeah. As you, as you said, and you reference um, my, my story of a, a injury, like as an eight, 17 year old immature kid who thought he was going to be able to play at a higher level and playing in division two. But, and I thought when the injury happened, like, oh my God, what the F I'm done. Like just almost like had depression and anger and not a teammate, but it was the best thing ever to go through as I look back. And I, I, and I'm 46. I remember that like it was yesterday. And I, I, I rely on that experience and I almost have more appreciation for my parents. You know, my, my dad, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about this, but my mom, like just as a parent watching a child put so much effort and hard work into something and then having it taken from you. Totally. And I never once felt like, Oh my, my, I never once felt like my mom had wrapped up like my football as her identity. Um, I never once felt like even like when I was like trying to figure out who I was my freshman year in college, I am I can be able to make it. I never once, they made me never feel bad. And then thankfully you had some good teammates, great coaches, and it slowly kind of kept making my way and then played. But I think about that as a journey now as a dad, like when my kids have things that maybe don't go their way, it's remembering, rem- remembering that it is a process and it is an out, like in the end game is, are they good people? Are they present? Do they show up on time? Can they tr- be trustworthy? Are they curious? Not like, did they score six points in T-ball, a T-ball <laughs> basketball, I mean, a basketball yeah, game, yeah, yeah. or did they get a double in T-ball? Like who right. cares? Yeah. Who cares? And so, um, I love that you learned about identity. Cause I think there's a lot of, I'm, I'm sure there's moms or dads listening right now that feel like they're defined by what they do. Right. You know, I mean, even the work I do, Ryan, as a, as a coach now, or companies and executives is, I mean, I was, I was, I, I use my story as like to drive further drive humility into people. It's like, I was the number one guy at this company for years, but guess what? I don't talk to them anymore. They don't, I mean, they, they liked me, but I don't, they're not checking on me every month. Their stocks up X percent. They're doing great. Maybe I was the problem. Maybe, maybe they're doing great without me. Yeah. We're all replaceable. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt. So I, I think identity is such, I think about the last two and a half years of our life, right? Where things that we thought, and I'll just use the sports example too, because being somebody whose you know, career is focused on leadership and development of, of youth specific within the context of, of athletics. I mean, you think about the juniors and seniors that lost their entire junior senior year of athletics. I mean, for most of us, that's the pinnacle of our entire life journey. If you're an athlete, yeah. right. I want to play varsity and go to prom and, 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 you know, win a state title, right. Or whatever it is. And, and here in, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, that's just no school, no sports. you right. And so the amount of the, the mental toll, that the last few years has taken on our, our young athletes. Um, they're going to write books about it for decades. I promise you Mm -hmm. it it will fill a shelf in a, in a psychiatrist's, uh, uh, office around the impact of, of, um, isolation and, and the identity issues that stem from, from, uh, the last couple of years. It's been tough. Mm. Well, maybe that's a transition into what you're doing now. So for people that don't know what FCA is, um, maybe talk about how, how did you get involved with, with, with this organization? And, and then second question would be, how has this impacted you as a dad? Yeah, absolutely. So I was actually coaching a, uh, kind of select youth all-star team, um, from my local town got, got actually my pastor asked me to, uh, I had, I was coached high school baseball for a bunch of years in the community. And, uh, he asked me to kind of take on this group of boys that were kind of leaving the the city league, if you will, and, and really wanted to bring faith and mentorship into the context of baseball. And so I jumped on that opportunity is, is, uh, I hadn't had that opportunity up to that point, just coaching high school baseball in the public school setting. And, uh, just ended up kind of having a, a magical year with these, these 12 year old boys. And we ended up winning the state title and it just happened to be that one of the FCA board member's sons was on the team. And, and they wanted to relaunch FCA in the, in the Portland market. And I had never had it, you know, really faith wasn't really part of my journey up until the summer before my senior year in high school. And so um, I had, had never had a touch with FCA or any context to it. Um, but I, I think a couple things really made it make sense for me. First, it, it was just a collision of the two greatest passions for me which was, it was sports and, and, and faith and Jesus. And, and, and then secondly, I, I kind of have an entrepreneurial spirit about me and the idea of building something from scratch was super exciting. And, um, so I think those three things combined said, you know, made me feel like this was, this is what, uh, you know, God had kind of called me to and a place where I could really, you know, build something special and, and win and have an impact on people's lives. And I think that was, uh, that was a big motivator for me. And how has it impacted you as a dad? Well, it's been, it was interesting. So like the first, uh, you know, I, I made the transition. So actually I did a two-year area director training program after my time at commercial real estate with Young Life, which is another youth ministry. And uh, I was coaching high school baseball during that and then transitioned into FCA. And so, and I, and I got married during that time. So married, no kids, right? So I was ministering to everybody else's kids. And, and all mm-hmm. the guys on the baseball team and, and the football team, the local schools. And, and um, so I loved, I think my entire life, the, the, the paradigm of always being coached, like there was somebody always coaching me. I was very comfortable with that. Um, and, and to be honest, going back to my dad, like he was a direct communicator. He gave constructive criticism. Uh, I remember, you know, we probably all have a couple of those stories of, of driving home from the games and you're in the back seat, and, and dad's giving you the breakdown, right? But, and I was, unlike my sisters, I, I could take that and I learned from it and I got better because of it. Um, and so I think uh, when I stepped into that role with FCA, I was instantly in a mentor, kind of a leadership role for some of these young athletes. And, um, and that was very comfortable to me. Um, I feel like, I was kind of gifted with some coaching ability and uh, I love the opportunity to try to create awareness around identity and who you are and what brings purpose and what brings significance. And um, those years were, were awesome because I was like, you know, we probably heard as a parent, it takes a village 
And I was part of that village, right? And I had a lot of moms and dads calling me, man, thank you for, you know, investing in my son or, you know, encouraging my daughter or whatever, whatever it may be. And, and um, I loved the opportunity to, to leave a mark on somebody's life, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I, for me, I've always kind of told people, I feel like relationship is the currency of God's kingdom, right? So show me a rich man and show, I'll show you somebody who's got, who's loved deeply and has a lot of valuable relationships. And so um, I think now as a dad, um, it's, it's, it's the last like decade of my life is like real life. Cause now my kids are, are part of SA. Now my kids are going to the camps. Now I'm trying to line up mentors for my kids, you know, cause, cause I realize that, that I want to have a significant part of leaving a mark on my kids, but, but I need other people. Right. And I'm praying that they'll have some, some coaches and, and some other mentors that will, will lead and guide them along the way. So I think that's the fun part right now is just seeing, especially my oldest, get to that age where the ministry uh, has the opportunity to impact her as well. Hey everybody, it's Casey Jaycox. I want to take a quick break to talk about my friends up at Catch Sick of Seafoods who continue to be just an amazing, loyal sponsor. And for those that you've tried it, thank you. For those of you who haven't, you're missing out. And now's the time to make sure that you visit catchsickofseafoods.com and get some of those amazing smoked salmon, get some of that amazing rockfish, blackfish, black cod, uh, salmon, whatever it might be, whatever you you like. But what's great about opportunities they have, now's the time to subscribe to a box so that you're gonna get that reliable cadence of the best fish directly from the dock to the doorstep. And what's great about Catch Sick of Seafoods, they make it so easy. So those that maybe aren't the best chefs at home, who doesn't matter, they're gonna give you this beautiful, uh, nice laminated uh, recipe card that tells you exactly how long to cook it, whether you're going to barbecue, you're going to bake, you're going to fry, whatever, whatever the way you want to do it, they're going to make it easy. So please visit them today, catch sick of sign up for a subscription so that you know, you're going to get the best fish delivered directly to your door. You won't regret it. And just like my daughter Riley says, dad, I don't even like fish. And she does now because of my friends up at catch sick of seafood. So with that, let's get right back to today's episode. Mm. I love it. You're making me think of a previous episode. Do you by the name, by chance, name Steve Alec? I do. I was just with him Saturday. He okay. was at our event at UW. So Coach Valak, if you're listening, brother, shout out. You're, you're making us talk about you. So he's a former PL, PLU loot. He also is the head coach at Liberty High School here in Renton, Washington. And one of the things Coach Valak talked about was mentorship. Mm-hmm. And ironically, he's his son was mentored by another former quarterback diecast listener. I'm an interviewee named Tony Davis, the head coach at Tahoma, former head coach at at, uh, Tahoma high school, Mm -hmm. athletic director, great man. And ironically, what's funny is we call this guy calls, I don't know what we're going to call it, but like, so Tony's son mentored Valak's kid. It's awesome. You know, and like it made me, and you're saying this, it just is kind of more top of my mind now today as I think about like, you know, the best coaches we've had are, or people, they, they spoke truth into us. They believed in us. They, they showed us what was possible. They, maybe they said some things that we needed to hear at the time, but it's, it's, it's different than when you hear from someone else other than mom or dad. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe as you've, for dads listening at home or moms, if you've, if you've heard, if they're thinking like, well, how do you get a mentor? Like what, what are some things that you've seen work in your journey as you're leading FCA? Well, I, I think sports in of itself creates a great opportunity for that mentor, right? Unfortunately though, and probably why FCA exists is coaches can be good influences or bad influences. And for every great, for every Steve Alec out there, there's probably a few coaches that, uh, you know, are, are not a good mentor or, or not a good, good influence. And so, um, I think, I think athletics leads itself to that, but, um, you know, obviously, you know, from a, from a faith angle, this is where FCA plays, right? I, I tell people FCA is about three things. It's leadership, discipleship, and partnership, right? And uh, leadership for me is about the direction of our influence, right? And I tell parents that coaches and athletes have influence. They're leaders on every high school campus, right? On every campus, they're leaders, but but direction matters, right? And so young RJ at 17 was a leader, And I had influence and people were following me, but I was taking people in directions they shouldn't be going. Right. And so I I think, uh, I think from that standpoint, you're, you're looking for, uh, 
somebody that shares the same values and characters. It's not about what you do, but about who you're becoming. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I, you know, there's a one piece of scripture that I just feel like this has been my, one of my life verses, but where, where Paul says to the Corinthian church, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. There's probably no better picture of mentorship or discipleship in one sentence. So who are you following? You know, and there's been a lot of quotes on that. Like, you know, show me your five closest friends and five people you spend the most time with. I'll show you your future. Right. It's kind of that premise. Yeah. Who are you following? So, um, that's, that's for me as a dad, I'm really just, just been, you know, praying and asking and praying that God would put people that in my kids' lives that they can follow. And it's going to take them to a, to a, a place of, of, uh, high character and loving and serving others well. And, and just being a, being a, major influence for, on the community. Yeah. I think that's, that's well said, man. I think too, like mentorship doesn't have to be this formal thing. I think half the time is just be, put, put, put yourself out there and ask, Hey, I, I love your son or daughter. He or she yeah. is amazing. Would they be willing to spend some time with my son? Yeah. I think most people are gonna be like flattered that you thought of it. And yeah. they'd be like, and most people have a servant's mindset or servant's heart. I teach people to be a boomerang, but don't keep score. Right. You know, always serve. And I think you and I talked about even before when we first met, like I just for others, like I don't, I want like, cause I think religion, spirituality, it can be a, these dicey topics. It gets people going certain ways for me. Yeah. I've never been in like the last call it 15, 20 years. Some that has attended a church every single week and call it excuse, call it whatever. It's maybe it's just time. It's, I got kids and crazy sports and we're going all over the place. However, the one thing I, my church for me is, I, I, I look at a daily scripture every morning. Sometimes it makes zero sense. I'm like, what in the Sam's hell did that mean? Mm-hmm. And, but I, but more of it's like a competitive thing in the Bible app because I keep the street going. I don't want to like <laughs> yeah. not, not see that thing start over. Yeah. Um, and then I do a gratitude journal. Yeah. And every morning I say, God, thanks for waking me up. Mm-hmm. And today, which is, this is where I feel like you I'm getting goosebumps as I'm about to tell you this. Um, I'm going to look at it real quick for those. Um, uh, when sometimes when I read these in the morning, um, this was Psalm 18. It said, um, Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my shield and a horn of my salvation, my stronghold for whatever reason. The first thing I thought of was like, okay, that, that is like hit me in the heart for what my wife's going through right now. And like, how do I, how can I make sure that she knows, Hey, set a prayer for you, honey. Right. Um, and I think that's where I, I, what I get out of spirituality is it doesn't have to be in a building. For me, right. my pen, personal opinion. Right. Like, I feel like maybe you and I are having church today. Amen. Yeah. No, it, yeah, for me, it's a, you know, I, especially not growing up and kind of with a religious background, it's all about relationship. Right. And uh, so it's, it's 24 seven. It's, it's as much Monday through Saturday as it is Sunday. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I love that verse too. I mean, I think about a rock and a refuge. Right. Even speaking to what we've already talked about, about identity, you know, what are you standing on? You know, mentorship, who are you following? And and refuge, like a place of protection. I think about your wife, like when you're having health concerns, that's scary. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so there's this place of protection. Um, Psalm 37, four, the angels of the Lord and camp around those that fear him. I love that picture. I love about just refuge, providing effort, encamping around me, protection. I'll, I was going to mention this uh, as a, one of the dad issues I'm going through right now. We recently had a fire, um, mm. which is really scary for our family. And my eight year old daughter last night, um, she's having some anxiety and, and fear around fire. And so I had to write a bunch of truths down on a piece of paper. And each night before she goes to bed, she just reads those truths, you know? And, um, and that's like to your point of a scripture a day or like just reading a truth and going like, no, like God is my refuge. That's the first truth on that piece of paper is God is my refuge and, and he's in the business of protecting me mm-hmm. just like my dad is. Right. And then the second truth is my dad will protect me. He's in the business of protecting me. The third truth was fires don't start themselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> but she's just been really concerned over the last couple of weeks about us having another fire and, 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 and it seems to, it, I don't know if this is a pride thing for me, but her anxiety and fear is always more when her mom's working at night. And I'm like, come on, dad, what am I, 
What am I, I chopped liver here? Right. Exactly. I can, I can keep you safe, girl. But uh, so I, lo- I love the idea of, of, of reading truth and, and reframing your mind. Um, and uh, I think we serve a God that protects us for sure. Yeah, I love that. I uh, you made me think of something that I learned from a friend named Colin Henderson. It's called um, it's like a four minute meditation called the Ha Method. Hmm. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's like it's it aligns with what you just said. So the first minute you just breathe, and you're doing this in a, in a spot with no distraction. So first minute is just breath, just deep breaths, kind of feeling where your body's at. Second minute is I have statements. It's physical, emotional, or opportunistic. You're speaking truth into it, what things you have, and, and it doesn't have to be like you know, I have an opportunity to exercise today, or I have an opportunity to be a great dad. I have an opportunity to be present. Then the third minute is I am statements. Yeah. And then yeah. the fourth minute is I will statements again, physical, emotional, or opportunistic speaking truth into what's going to happen. And I found when I do it, I mean, I get that feeling inside my body. I feel like something's happening that I can't describe or explain, but it just brings me to the right level of mindset. Yeah. Um, it's awesome. I want to go back, Ryan, you mentioned, so FC you talked about leadership, disciple, uh, discipleship and partnership. Talk about what does discipleship and partnership mean for people? If they don't yeah. Know. So our mission is to lead every coach and athlete in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. So the first two words mean to lead. That's the leadership piece. The middle part in uh, every coach and athlete in a growing relationship with Jesus. That's how we define discipleship. So you're just on a journey and it, it's a relationship. And, and it's, and so that's, that's that mentorship discipleship journey. And then the last two words is his church. And so when I think about his church, I don't think about, you know, necessarily Sundays. I think about all the body of believers, right? And all of us just uh, locking arms in, and kind of Ephesians 4 talks about the body of Christ, the hands and feet. So we're just, we're all a part of his church. And so, and I just have a premise that we're better together, right? Mm-hmm. And I just have such a high value on relationship. And I don't think God brings people into my life, uh, you know, for no reason. And so, I mean, I, I, even part of our conversation today, I just feel like I have a lot to learn from you, Casey, and uh, I think there's a reason that you're in my life, and I'm glad we get to have this conversation. No, oh, I appreciate that. Well, it's, um, I love how you said it, too, because I think for those that, and I hope that if there's people listening, that maybe you 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 put religion in a, in a in a box because you didn't like the man or woman that makes horrendous decisions Monday through Saturday, goes to church on Sunday. Hey, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I, I can do that because it doesn't have to be that way, and I think... Um, I think we all just, when you believe in something bigger than all of us and, um, we, it's, it's not a fluke we're here. And I love when those moments happen, like whether it's our time together or those moments, I believe things happen for a reason. I get inspiration from that. It keeps me positive, mm-hmm. keeps me present. Um, and I think the more I'm, those things happen, I'm, I feel like I'm looking for them more, yeah. which is sure. fun, creates more curiosity, keeps, creates a better relationship. Um, Okay. I want to ask you, um, I want to ask you about like an area of your dad game that, uh, we all have gaps. M- mine's patience. I always like to go first to let remove fear from the, from uh, our, our guests. So like as a competitive person, I have to be present and self-aware about when I find my, I get impatient. I say, okay, what's going on, dude? Why? So like yeah. for you, right, as an area, your dad game, talk about an area of that you, you, you know, maybe it's not where you want it to be, but at least you're, you're, you're committing to getting better at it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I got a great example from this week, so it's fresh. So ho- hopefully okay. I can articulate <laughs> it well, but, uh, I was, uh, in Kansas city all week for our FCA's global leader meetings, kind of a twice a year, um, journey for four or five days. So I was out of the house for four or five days and, uh, just happened that we had uh, the Greater Portland FCA Coaches and Marriage Weekend was was this last weekend. We'd throw a marriage retreat for coaches and their spouses at the Hilton in Vancouver. So Molly and I went, and uh, it was awesome. We had Dave Canales, a quarterback's coach for the Seahawks. Him and his wife were speaking, and they did a great job. And we were hanging out with them. And and we Molly and I got home that night, and uh, Dave was talking about um, what it means to hear his – Lizzie's authentic voice, right? I think sometimes when we get into the, uh, the flow of, of young kids, it's just, we're just on uh, cruise control, right? We've got to get the kids here, get them there. Are they fed? Do they have clothes on? Okay, great. Got to get them to practice. And, um, and, and as a husband and wife team, you just, you just go through the motions because you just got to get the job done. Right. And so 
he was kind of challenging us husbands. Like when's the last time you actually stopped and like heard your, your wife's authentic voice, right? It wasn't like just the, the go through the routine. And so that night I, I was sitting with, with Molly and I just said, Hey, I really want to like hear, like just stop. And I want to hear your voice, you know? And like, how are you? Like, this is, I'm about to leave for five or six nights. It's going to be crazy. All the things. And uh, so we were just kind of doing a check-in and then there was like some survey questions. And like, um, one of the questions was like, you know, what's one thing that really bothers you about me? And, uh, she went right after it and she said, (laughs) I gotta be honest. Like, I hate the way you reenter our household after you've been gone for four or five nights. And, um, and I said, Oh, okay. Um, tell me more, you know, trying to ask more questions, you know, Mm -hmm. stay humble, be, you know, be curious. And, and, uh, so I I think she gave me some really good information that night, you know, and told me how it was, which was, I needed to hear. And then this whole week as I was gone, I was kind of building my five point reentry plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. What am I going to do to make it different? You know, how, how can I make it feel different? And, you know, I think for me, I, I have a tendency to be kind of a type a, like, I'll come into the household and I mean, it looks like a bomb went off and there's like body parts over here and Legos over (laughs) here and, and Barbies over here. And I'm like, dear God, what's happened here, you know? And Mm -hmm. I can kind of go into Sergeant Slaughter mode and just getting everybody back in order. And my wife's just like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to like step outside and come back in and try it again? So a couple of things on my five point plan was first and foremost, uh, acknowledge and affirm her twice as much as I acknowledge and affirm the kids. I don't know if, if you're like this when your kids were little, but I opened the door or they heard the garage door even open and all three of them were running, dad, you know, doing the mm-hmm. thing. And, and, um, and then I can kind of just get so caught up in that, that I just like forget to acknowledge my wife, you know, yeah. just horrible. It sounds worse saying it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I wanted to come in this time and just really acknowledge you know, acknowledge the kids, but acknowledge her twice as much, you know, mm-hmm. and acknowledge that she's just come off four or five nights without me. And that's really hard. And what does that look like? And then, and then I wanted to do twice as much listening as I did talking. Right. And how are you? What's been going on? What was tough about today? How can I help? Right. Going back to you running around the house today, just trying to serve your wife because she's in a, you know, going through a tough spot. It was kind of that same premise of like, I got to get outside of myself. Yeah, I got to focus in on her needs and I got to be a great, great teammate right now, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be what I would tell you I'm working on right now. And to me, it's just an emotional intelligence journey for me, an awareness journey. Again, it's dying to myself every day, kind of getting over myself and, uh, and, and really believing that like, this woman is incredible. She's amazing. I love her to death. Like I absolutely believe like, God picked her for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm so thankful because I'm learning. I, I can, I think a lot of guys could probably say this about their marriage, but marriage is like looking into a mirror. I mean, it is, if there's been anything that God's used to reveal all the brokenness of me, <laughs> it's been my marriage, you mm-hmm. know, but yet it's also a place of great strength because I've been able to grow through it. So love that dude. It's, um, that, I mean, we've talked, I've talked to a lot of dads about like, don't bring your baggage into the house. Uh, and listening, we've done a lot of episodes on listening and I don't, we'll never stop doing episodes on listening because it's a freaking massive gift you give people, how you make them feel. Uh, shout out to a guy named Matt Miller, who I'm going to call when we're done here because he and I are playing phone tag right now. And Matt Miller gave me one of the best dad questions ever that you essentially paraphrase a little bit, but he just says, he says it to his dad, his kids and his wife. He goes, tell me how I can be a dad, better dad this week. Tell me how I can be a better husband this week. Yeah. And so like, I mean, shout out to you, bro, for like being coachable for your wife. Cause I think dad's one thing you'd never heard Ryan talk about was getting defensive saying, what are you talking about? I don't do that. Like yeah. if you're going to ask a good question, a powerful question and you want to be vulnerable or to hear your gaps, tack them. Yeah. Right. And I love that you did that, man. And, um, I think another thing you said that is so important that dads need to realize me included how, how we show up and love our wife in front of our kids is a learned behavior. Oh yeah. You know, and not only, so 
as much as we want to teach our kids verbally, I think you're going to teach them more powerful things via the, 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 the just the loving cues, the body language cues, how we show up. They're watching always every yeah. single thing we do, whether we think so or not. Um, so true. So true. Yeah. I'm not sure that there's anything we could do to have more of an influence on our kids than show them an unconditional loving marriage relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. so, no, it's real life. I love it. Um, okay. So as, as you think about all the things we've talked about, we've, we've hit on a lot of really cool topics. Um, if you had to like summarize what we've talked about today into like kind of actionable tasks that dads can take from this episode to say, Hey, these are two or three things I could be thinking about to become that better ultimate quarterback or leader in my home. Um, tell me what comes to mind. Well, I think I'll just start with the power of relationship, right? Um, I heard a talk by a guy named Arthur Brooks, who's a professor of business at Harvard. And uh, his opening line is, I teach happiness, which he's done like a decade study on happiness. And he says, focused attention equals love. And I love that, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I want to have a dynamic, you know, deep relationship with my kids or my wife, it's going to come down to focused attention. Um. I'll even go kind of one step further. It's like my ability to see them, right? Like in that moment when my eight-year-old daughter's scared because there's a fire and she can't sleep and we're reviewing those truths, like what I'm really trying to let her know is that I see you mm -hmm. and I'm with you and I love you. Mm -hmm. Your dad loves you. And so I, th I think I would just say right there that like I would just encourage all, all of the dads – out there listening that, you know, if nothing else, let your kids know that you see them and that you love them. And one of the ways that you can do that is through focused attention. And I think I'm just getting to that kind of the stage where it's like, I get to do one-on-ones with my kids, you know, which is so awesome, you know, and I got the blessing of being a, a boy dad and a girl dad. So it's like my focused attention with my eight-year-old is going to be different than with my five-year-old little boy, right? Yeah. Which is different than my two and a half-year-old little girl. Right. So I think that would probably be the first, first thing I would, I would, that I think would sum up kind of what we we've chatted about, um, today. I think, I think the next thing that I think could sum up is just how critical, especially when adversity hits identity is, you know, and you talked about the scripture talking about standing on the rock, um, and Arthur Brooks, he went on to do a talk and he talked about what, what makes somebody happy based off the data in society. And he says, there's the, the number one indicator for happiness in society is an integrated life. And he defined an integrated life as seen, soothed, safe, and secure. And I wrote those four S's down. I was like, okay, Casey, there's my, there's my, Can my, you say my it again. Word. seen, soothed, so, okay. safe, and secure. And I think from a dad standpoint, you know, I came home and I was talking to my wife about that. I was like, okay, do our kids feel seen? I was like, okay, I think we're doing okay there. Do my kids feel soothed? Well, you're a nurse. So like you crush this. And my mom crushed that with me. And But dad needs to soothe too. So I'm, I'm trying to especially, you know, be there, be there in that way. Safe, you know, trying to create protection and refuge. But the last one was secure, kind of haunted me a little bit. Cause it's like, gosh, I just don't know if I can provide security for them. And I think the premise that, that I would probably argue is that their security, in my opinion, is going to come down to whatever their identity's in. And if it's in anything outside of knowing who created them, at least from my perspective, I think, I think they're going to face a lot of insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be, you know, for those that are maybe in the faith community or outside the faith community, like what brings you security? What yeah. gives you security? Um, because anything of this world can be taken away at any moment, you know? So Amen. I, I would say that would probably be the big one, you know, it's just where's your identity come from? See, I, I, that's why I love taking notes, everybody, with these as the, as the host. If you've you listened to these and you've not taken notes, go back and listen to episodes. There's so much wisdom that selfishly I get from talking to so many amazing dads, Ryan included, that um, I got goosebumps when I said that and I felt that um, 
and just it it like makes me think like okay these are these give you great opportunities to have conversations with your wife that are not about sports weather or random stuff that mean nothing right 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 like the deep stuff that bring you closer to people so mm-hmm. i love that man so i wrote i i wrote down kind of your three like you know power of leader relationship leading to leadership intentional being intentional with your presence but around love that focus mm-hmm. attention mm-hmm. and then making sure that we and this is where you have to ask yourself these tough questions. Maybe it's for your wife, your a friend, buddy, like who, how are we defined and what is our identity? And if adversity strikes, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, so, cause it's, I mean, adversity is where, uh, you know, life, there's going to be, there's going to be, um, struggle. And you think of Tony Bennett, the old Virginia coach, he always said the adversity is life's golden ticket. Yeah. You know, and that when he, this is, you know, not a big scheme of things, but it, when they were the 16 seed, first time they ever lost to a one seed. And next year yeah. they go back and win the oh, national championship. I watched that game. Yes. <laughs> it still crushes my soul just to think about it. But what a teaching moment. And the way oh. he handled that. Wow. Oh, dude. So and he, it was like nothing. He wasn't rattled. He wasn't, his identity wasn't that loss. No, it wasn't because he was secure because he knew who he was. Yep. All right. This has been fun. Um, before we direct people on how they can learn more about you and FCA, we're, we go into the lightning round, which is I go completely random. Okay. And uh, I just asked you anything that comes to the top of my mind. My, my goal is to helpfully get a giggle out of you. Your job is to kind of keep these things going as quick as you can. Okay. I'll do All my right. Best. Uh, true or false, you're a massive Oregon State fan. <laughs> Very much false. There's Sorry, a giggle. For, for everybody who don't know, there's massive Oregon gear behind him. You guys can't see that I can see. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure we say go Beavs and go Ducks for those listening. That's right. Um, if you were to do anything else, than you're doing right now, what would be the, the dream job? Oh man. Well, just for the sake of, of being quick, I would love to get back into coaching. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I'm kind of torn whether I want to coach my kids, uh, after youth league, you know, yeah. but I would love to maybe coach at the high school level again. Um, there you just go. love the relationships. Yep. Um, if you were to book a vacation right now, where are you going? Over water bungalow. I don't care where, just an overwater bungalow. It's on my list. I want to go there. Uh, that's on my list too. Uh, if I was to go into your phone, uh, what would be one song that your buddies would be? Seriously, you listen to that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Encanto soundtrack. I got three little kids. We're, we're busting a lot of soundtracks and movies, but right now it's Encanto. Okay. If you were to play one musical instrument, what would it be? I would love to play the guitar. I can actually play the piano. I think, thanks mom for uh, seven years of lessons, but I would love to play the guitar. So why don't I teach you how to play guitar and you teach me how to play piano? Ooh, I don't know if I do that good, but I, we, I could at least give you some foundations. <laughs> there you go. Um, if there was a book written about your life, tell me what would be the title. Bloom where you're planted. Balloon. Bloom where you're planted. Oh, bloom where you're planted. Okay. I like that. It's got deep, deep thought to it. Um, now, Ryan, this, this book is, is um, getting traction. It's in airports. <laughs> uh, Hollywood has found out about this book, and now they're going to make a, a, a movie. Tell me who's going to star you. Oh, gosh. Who I would love to star me? <laughs> I, have, I can't admit this, but I've got a little man crush on Wahlberg. Okay. So I, I would have him star me. He's I, a dude. I, I, he is a dude. He's a good golfer, tough. He's got the most amazing golf backyard if you've ever seen it. I've never seen his backyard. Oh, Google it. It's but stupid. I, doesn't he, I think he hangs out with Bubba Watson a lot. I think I've seen them playing golf together. Oh, really? I've got them playing golf together. So I could see that in his backyard. I thought you might say Matt Damon. I kind of see a little Matt Damon in you. Okay. Matty D. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a great actor too. I would, yeah. I would not be ashamed of him playing me either. There we go. There we go. Um, okay. Last question. Tell me two words to describe your wife. Caring. Intentional. There we go. Lightning round's complete. You win. I also won. I got a giggle. Uh, it's always fun. It's always random. I have some of the similar questions I like to ask people, but a lot of times you let curiosity go and take you wherever you want to go. Um, for people who want to learn more about you, they want to learn more about FCA, the FCA. They want to get involved, whether it's through donations, through their time, through their, whatever it may be. Tell me yeah. what's the best way people can learn more about you. Yes, yeah, www.pnwfca.org. pnwfca.org, okay. Yeah. 
And are you a, a social media guy on LinkedIn, Twitter? And you? I'm on LinkedIn? LinkedIn, a little bit of Facebook. My my team's making me uh, do some Twitter and Instagram, but I'm not. I, I I think I'm lucky that I grew up in a generation where like Facebook came out when I was in college, so I was just on the front end of it. I'm, yeah. I'm not huge into it, but uh, I do have some Facebook and LinkedIn and Insta. There we go. Do you know your handles by chance? <laughs> oh gosh, see that's a. I if don't. Not, I can I mean, find I could pull it up for you. That's that's how much Instagram I am right there. R Johnston 5 on Insta. At R Johnston 5 There we go. There you go. I will tag you. I will when this episode comes out, man. Thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome getting to know you better. I really yeah. appreciate the time. Um, these conversations bring so much joy, love, and positivity to my life, and I'm beyond thankful that I'm doing this and shout out to Ty Nunez brother uh, he's a former college teammate of mine without without him this this journey of uh, interviewing amazing dads w- would have never been started so I'm so I have so much gratitude towards him so um, thanks again for your time man I really appreciate it and uh, I look forward to connecting soon absolutely thanks Casey this has been yep. great